Well, good morning, LinkedIn. Uh, my name is Joel Bennett. I'd like to welcome you to another episode of Practical Leadership, an opportunity for you to learn how to be a more effective leader and to build leadership habits into your daily work. If you are tuning in live, uh, please say hello in the comments. Tell us where you're joining us from. Uh, it's a lot more fun when we know there's a live audience out there, and we always love uh, seeing new uh, listeners, uh, new viewers, as well as old friends. If you joined us uh, last week for our session on diagnosing people performance issues, I'd love to hear how your commitments in those areas went. Maybe share a little bit about what you were focused in on, as well as any progress that you were able to make. So let's see who we've got here today. Let's see if any comments start streaming in. Andrew, it's great to see you uh, calling in from France right now. That that right, you're you're leading the uh, the distance meter for us. Nicholas, uh, thanks for joining us. Is MA? I'm guessing that's US, but uh, yeah, throw a little bit more in there. We'd love to to hear more. Nerdan, great to see you. Tanya from Newton. Jamie from Knoxville. I think, Jamie, you just uh, earned your uh, groupie badge today. I think this is your third or fourth session. Emily, great to see you from Pella. Right down the road from me. Jennifer calling or calling in. Jennifer viewing from West Des Moines. This isn't this isn't like a radio station. I'm not sure what I'm doing here. Alyssa, great to see you as well. Oh, Massachusetts, Nicholas. I, I I wanted to make sure I wasn't uh, misunderstanding you. Perfect. Well, um, for those that haven't been with us before, during these sessions, we try to tackle real leadership issues, uh, challenges that you may be having, as well as trying to encourage you to apply what you're learning during the session and provide actionable steps uh, to put it into practice and weave it into your own leadership practices and uh, team culture. So I've asked leadership experts from around the world to join me to share their own perspectives, uh, their own experience around leadership with uh, you today. And so I'm excited to be joined by Laura Creston, uh, operational coach, strategy expert, and the master of the post-it note. Uh, Laura is, uh, we've known each other for probably about six years now, and she's been an invaluable uh, resource for me as I've uh, done strategic planning in my own business and I think you're going to enjoy some of her thoughts. So thanks for joining me, Laura. It's great to see you. Great to be here, Joel. Thank you so much for having me. And great to see so many friends on the comment board. Hey, everybody. So uh, our topic today is uh, creating a blueprint for productivity. And I think the topic has application for almost anybody, whether you're a team leader or a team member. And I'm excited to get started with our conversation. But I do want to reinforce that we'd love for you to stay active in the chat in the comments section and share your own perspectives or experience, uh, maybe challenges that you're having around the topic. And obviously, if you have any questions along the way, we're going to try to spend some time answering questions uh, and make sure that you leave uh, with, with those answered. So drop your thoughts in the chat and we'll respond to you after the session um, if we can't get to it during the session. And if you're watching this as a recording, uh, you're not really off the hook. We'd love to hear your comments um, your experience as well. And uh, and after the session, I'd be happy to, to comment or to answer those as I can. So we'll see. Uh, looks like Arlene is joining us uh, from Australia. Fantastic. I think she's got an extremely early morning or late night, depending on uh, the, how you view that. So Arlene, thanks for being a part of this. Um, so now that we've got a pretty full house, uh, let's get started. Sure. So, Laura, when I interact with leaders in the workplace um, and I ask questions like, hey, how are you doing? It seems like the typical answer is busy. Um, and the com biggest complaint I hear from them is that they feel like they're not in control of their day. So how would you suggest people get to the point of owning their time with everything that seems to be swirling around them? Joel, I love that. I love the answer of busy because as a coach, the first question I go to is busy doing what? Busy is a great word that, you know, just encapsulates everything. But if you can't articulate what it is you're doing, then you're really not really clear on how your time is being spent or even what your priorities are. So some of the things I do as a coach with my clients is ask them a number of questions. So first of all, I ask them who owns their calendar. 
are they putting things in their calendar or are other people putting things in their calendar? Do they have actually time blocked off for themselves to do some work? How do you plan your time? And if you work with a to-do list, is it a laundry list that's all in a row? Or is it linearly defined so that you can sequentially see the steps you need to take along the way? Mm. That's somewhat interesting for some people because to me, a stack is very um, anxiety driving. Whereas linear, I can just check things off and feel like I'm building momentum as I go. So it's just much more action oriented. The other thing is really think about how far in advance do you plan your work and your life? They need to go together. So what are you doing about that? Do you have set start times and end times? When do you do your best work? What are your non-negotiables? And most importantly, how do you prioritize your own care and your own bandwidth? So to combat some of these questions, have some open discussions and some thoughts around, you know, are you measuring how you are spending your time? You could do that with a spreadsheet or you could do there's a million apps out there. And over a month, you can think about, you know, where am I spending my time and do I need to change some things? One of the things I tend to talk about are the monkeys. Are people giving you things? So these are monkeys that they're handing you. Um, or are, is your to-do list something that you've actually created? So you set the priorities around what's most important to you to get done for your work uh, based on outcomes and objectives, or are they busy? Go back to that word, busy work things. I always ask too, you know, what's been sitting on your to-do list for longer than two weeks? Because like, is it really a thing? Is it a nice to-do or is it a must-do? And then the other thing to think about is like, what am I actually putting on that to-do list? Is it a habit? Like drink water. If that's on your to-do list, you haven't really built that habit yet. So we should think about that in a different construct than putting it on our calendars or managing our time. We should be thinking instead about what are our goals? What are we looking to achieve? And how are we prioritizing the steps to actually get there? Yeah. There's so much there I love. So the, the first piece, when you talked about, you know, thinking about a linear to-do list or linear schedule, um, I think one of the first things that you worked with me on was this thought process of, okay, well, that's your big goal or that's the big project, but what are the simple steps in between to start giving you some forward momentum? And I think that can be really impactful for somebody that feels like they're spinning all these plates or their plate is too full is maybe a better uh, analogy um, you know, instead of looking at the big plate or the stack of stuff they have to be able to say, okay, well, what gets me moving in the right direction today that sets me up for the next step tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I exactly. Love exactly. You know, I think about if I sum up the, the ideas there, including that one, it's like, what are the boundaries? So what are my goalposts? How, where do I want to get to? Then how do I manage the calendar to get there? And then intentionally looking at what I've accomplished this week so that I can prep for next week or right. the next month. All right. Great. So if, if I put myself in the seat of a, a busy person, which quite often I am in that, that seat, what's the, what's the simplest way for me to balance everything that I have to do? So I think about that stack of work or my, my plate that's overflowing. What's the simplest way to balance all that? So I think the first thing to do is eliminate the word balance from your vocabulary because it's never going to happen. Things are never going to sit equally. Life doesn't do that for us. We all know that. It's more about thinking about that plate or that platter that you're saying like a pie plate and all the slices and they're going to always shift. So it's not going to be always half a pie in one direction. You might have 20 slices one week and the next week you might have four. So thinking about it that way just shifts your mind into, okay, I don't have to keep everything stacked up straight. I can flex my pie the way that works best for me. So what's important about that is a few things. One, it's all about you. It's your boundaries that you set. And most importantly, that you respect first so others will respect them. Mm -hmm. An example of this is, you know, looking at your calendar and determining what time of the day do you work best? And is that where you've allocated some thinking time for yourself? And if, you know, Susie down the hallway wants to have a meeting with you at that time, respecting your own boundaries and saying, hey, you know what? Nine to 10 doesn't work. That's my key thinking time. Can we meet at 10, 15? And negotiating some of those things. You don't need to be in automatic response mode. And yes, doesn't need to be the first word out of your mouth every time. There are a number of ways to say no without really saying no. 
It's about understanding and digging in, asking some good questions about those that you're working with to help you create that sense of balance, if that's the word you want to use. Or to me, it's more about how to make that pie slices, the pie slices actually fit together. Other things to consider too is, you know, delegation and empowerment. Are we putting our actions and our to-dos where they actually belong? First of all, are they ours? And if they're not ours, who should be doing them? Or are they a thing that we should actually be doing at all? Those are always things to consider. So, other, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, Lori. Feel free, jump right in there. I guess one of the questions I can already see people asking is, well, that sounds great, um, but what if, what if it's my boss? Right. I don't really feel like I can say no to my boss. Right? Give me give me a little bit more about how I would deal with that situation. Great. Uh, gotta love a good boss is going to share good things for us to learn from, grow with and the challenges and probably stuff we even don't like to do. So getting really clear with your boss on what needs to be done and why. So managing their expectations along with your own and getting really clear on the when. So when do you need this box? Is this something that we need now? Because here are the priorities that I'm working on right now. Can you help me shift some of these priorities to make sure I can meet your needs? If that's truly the case. Normally, bosses can wait too. They are expecting probably 24, 48 hour turnaround. But you don't know that unless you ask. So there's a level of negotiation or compromise that may need to take place. Most importantly, it's about the agreements that you're making with your boss and being clear about, you know, here's how I'm working today. So let's talk about how this can work best for both of us. Yeah. I would say nine, nine times out of a hundred, your boss will be totally cool with that. Yeah. Well, and quite often they don't remember all the different things you're working on. So sometimes it's just a good reminder of, Hey, as you mentioned, you know, today I have blocked that. These are my top priorities. Does this actually move to the front of the line? You know, the thing that you're giving me, does that move to the front of the line or where would you place it as a priority? And, and I think the when of that starts to play itself out. If they're like, oh, shoot, I forgot. You've got this major project you're trying to land. Yeah, it's not as important as that. So finish that up and then let's circle back and talk about, you know, when or sometimes even how we get this accomplished. Because they may look at it and say, you know what, Laura, you're not the perfect person to do this right now because you're way busy with something else. Let me go take it to, you know, John um, and, and see if he can tackle it while, you know, while you're finishing up. You know, to go with the bosses too, Joel, is also our customers, whether they're internal or external, and how our email box or our Teams chat or our Slack channels are always blowing up with all kinds of things. So, you know, part of being able to do the work and, and keep your platter somewhat organized is turning off some of those notifications, but it's also assessing what type of notifications or emails you are getting or requests that you're getting so that from the particular clients that you're seeing, is it something that you should actually be doing, as you said, right? Like maybe John needs to do it. Example, in one of my uh, coaching sessions this past week, um, as we were digging into time management and thinking through all the things in the email, a pattern emerged that people were reaching out to this particular individual because they answer really quickly. And they know they're going to get their answer fast. So instead of using the central email box where her team actually tackles all these challenges, and they do a fabulous job tackling the challenges, um, they were just reaching out directly to her instead. And so we talked through some strategies around how do you redirect those emails back to the central central email box that it should be going to? And how do you help educate those folks who are reaching out to you and enlisting your team at the same time? And all of a sudden, there was this great sense of relief on her face where she was like, oh, my goodness, I never realized. When we looked at that, it was about 15 emails a day oh. that she could eliminate. And if you think think about, excuse me, those 15 emails taking anywhere from five to 10 minutes a day, uh, an email, that's a lot of time. Right. So just right. Give me a little bit of dissection on one small thing could make a huge difference. And, and the other piece I love there is it, you get what you reinforce, right? So if you're the person that always responds to an email within 15 minutes and people know that about you, um, sometimes they send you completely irrelevant messages because they know you'll respond quickly. And, and I'm all, I fall into that trap from time to time. Um, cause I always use my, my inbox as my to-do list. You know, if it's in my inbox, it's something I have to do. If it's not in my inbox, it's already done. Um, and so I always have to kind of call a timeout during my day and say like, I'm not looking at email for a couple hours cause I've got this other task to work on. 
and sometimes I'll even, which is weird, but sometimes I'll set my out of office for like a two hour period and just say, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm involved in meetings for the next few hours. Um, I'll get back to you, you know, later this afternoon. Uh, that at least helps me create those boundaries that you're talking about. I love that. So I call that put it somewhere. So when you're using your inbox as your to-do list, uh, taking it out of your inbox and putting it somewhere on your calendar is the best antidote to not having to switch back and forth. What happens when we see all those notifications, so one, turn off notifications so that you're not distracted. But if they're all in your email box and you're going through that email box um, in that two-hour time block, it may not all need to be done today. You may need more thinking time. You may need more time to experiment or research or dig in. and Or maybe you're just not in the right frame of mind to tackle some of those questions. So put it somewhere, put it somewhere on your calendar so that the next day or two days later, or even next week, you're looking at it and going, oh, now I know what to do with this. And now I can get back to that individual. You know, it could be a quick follow up that you're doing in two hour, in that two hour time block that says, hey, Laura, no worries. I see I saw your email. I've blocked some time to work on it on Friday. Does that work for you? No. Most of the time it does. And so it's out of your brain, it's out of, off of your plate, and it's onto your calendar, and you dedicate a time to it. And so now you can free up all kinds of time to really think and do the work you need to do. Yeah. I think I mentioned it, I know I mentioned it, a couple of, of sessions ago, I think when Sean Shepard was with us. Um, one tool that I've, I've started to really love um, is a website called focusmate.com. I'll drop that in the comments after a bit. But focusmate for me is just a way to, it's blocking time. But the way that it allows us to do that is to actually connect you with somebody else that's blocked the same amount of time. And it feels like a, a little bit of a, a Zoom call with a stranger. Um, so you both get on at you know, 10 o'clock. You tell each other what you're going to work on. You mute your microphones and you work. And then at the end, you say, here's what I got accomplished. And there's a level of accountability there um, that sometimes we don't have when we just block it and then realize, oh, I'm being distracted by this email and I only really used... 30 minutes of my one hour time block. Um, and that's been a really great tool for me. I'm still waiting for them to, to sponsor this show because I think I've <laughs> talked to, talked about them a couple of times in different ways. Um, so if you're out there, focus mate, you know, send us a note. Joel, just to pick up on that thread, you discovered focus mate. You've been working with that as a, as an app and it's a great accountability buddy. Do you spend time after that work reflecting on what you got done and how you're going to reapply some of those um, strategies in the future? I'm doing a better job of that. Truthfully, um, early on, it was just like, okay, I'm scratching stuff off my to-do list as quickly as possible. Now I'm realizing that there are certain times of the day that that makes a lot of sense for me. Um, you know, really two slots. One is where I already know I'm, I'm, you know, probably the most effective or most productive. It's just, a, I'm doubling down on that time. There are also some times in my day that are kind of transition zones between being productive um, and my next productive zone. And I, I want to make sure that I don't just zone out um, and get distracted by everything else that's going on. So, you know, I'll drop a focus mate session in there, you know, and because they can do different time periods, I'll throw like a 25 minute session in there so that I go from one thing, get a little bit of a breather, focus in on a small task for a little bit, get a breather and then go back to some of the big sp stuff I'm working on. But yeah, that, that reflection part of it is really important. I really love the way you call it the breather. To me, that's the time that, you know, your brain can adjust to the task switching that you're doing. Right. And when all these um, notifications are coming at us or we're seeing all these things pop up on our calendars, that task switching, even like shifting your eyes, takes a lot of time for your brain to come back to um, what you're supposed to be focused on or switching to the next thing. So I love that you're thinking of those as breather moments. You know, I coach a lot of my clients that that's the moment to get up, go get a glass of water, walk around the kitchen three times and then come back to your desk. Right. So that you can actually like literally clear yourself out of the space and, and dive right in. And that level of clarity then starts you off at that next part of your work being able to dive in and, and feel that one, you've accomplished things already and two, that you're going to accomplish something else. So that momentum keeps tracking for your day. Yeah. I, I may, I may want to throw you a, a little bit of a curveball here, but I know a few of the folks that are listening to us today, you know, they don't sit behind a desk. Um, you know, they don't spend a lot of time on email. Um, a lot of the organizations I work with are in construction, manufacturing, field service, all over the place where their office um, is whatever they can carry on them, right? Mm -hmm. A pencil, a, a notebook, um, maybe a clipboard. 
for somebody like that, where throughout the day, it just always feels like um, people around them or just the day in general is throwing curveballs at them on how to prioritize or what to prioritize. What kind of suggestions would you have for them on, you know, how to build a system to stay organized and prioritized on the go? Oh, I love that. That's a great one. So um, I'm a big fan of any app on my phone that will help me take a note or record something. So if I need to remind myself to do something, I'll usually record it in Evernote under whatever spot I need to record it so that I can remind myself to do it later if I get to my desk or I can listen to them on the way home in the car, like a little podcast of my own that's helping me think through things. Those will easily work. Um, I recall that type of pace um, in the environments that you're talking about, Joel, when I was back in my retail days. And um, I always had a notebook and a pen and a pen and piece of paper. And there's always a to-do list that I wanted to check off by the end of the day. And making time in your day to actually stop and look at that list was critical. So mm-hmm. taking that three or five minutes that you're grabbing a water or getting your next coffee, because I know these are high energy roles, to really look at that list and then cross out what you don't need to do or put next to it a day or a priority number, those two things could make a big difference for people. So if this is like Friday cleanup stuff that I don't need to think about, cool. If it's a follow-up item, what day am I following up on it? If there's a person I need to assign to it, assigning a name is also helpful. So that what happens is you build a routine around creating a list that has two other things on it, the who and the when. Is it a me thing or is it a somebody else thing? And when am I gonna do this? And the when also can include, is it a follow-up item or is it an actual to-do? So do I need to find time to sit down and do something? Yeah. I uh, A lot of the guys that I'll talk with, um, and whether it's on prioritization or just you know, how do I document what's going on with my team from a performance perspective, uh, many of them will say, I'm not I'm not, my, not much of a digital guy. I don't use my phone a lot. Um, and so they, they kind of throw up their hands like, oh, what was me? And my point is like, you don't have to carry around a phone all day. You can get one of those little steno notebooks, mm-hmm. right? The ones that waitresses yeah. use um, to take orders or for you to capture notes at home and just have that, right? And and capture those I, uh, items. Uh, the important part is like having that habit, as you mentioned, of when, you know, not only when do I write and the, excuse me, the who and the when, but how am I checking that throughout the day so that things get crossed off? And so, Maybe that is first thing in the morning from what I wrote yesterday. Uh, Maybe it is my first break or my lunch hour. Maybe it is an hour before the end of the day. So I make sure I I don't forget anything um, or if I need to delegate that I can give that to somebody um, prior to the next day. So they've got everything they need to do it. So I don't really feel like, you know, whether you're a digital lover or an analog lover, I think there are plenty of plenty of opportunities uh, for you to start to incorporate that into your day to day. Yeah, just don't, um, I guess the biggest advice I would have is don't focus on the fact that you're going to be able to keep it all in your head because something's going to always fall out. Yeah, a lot of things fall out of my head, um, typically the important ones. <laughs> it oh, goes back, put it somewhere, right? Put it somewhere. So put it somewhere, whether it's a digital uh, resource or it's pen and paper, or, you know, if you really want to carry around a stack of Post-its like I do, you know, you can do that too. Yeah. And, and you guys may have seen me say or heard me say about post-it notes. I think there were a couple of folks that know Laura well in the chat and have said as well how much she's a big lover of post-it notes. And I have them all over my desk, um, but I have them in specific areas of things I need to, 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 to finish up. So speaking of finishing up, as we, as we work toward a uh, conclusion for today, um, as you know, we like to keep things pretty practical, hence the name of, of the sessions that we do to help people kind of move in small steps toward uh, the, the direction they need to head to improve their leadership. So as we talk about this whole topic of prioritization or, or creating a, a blueprint for, for productivity, what's just one simple step that people watching today could put into practice, you know, even yet this week? Sure, sure. So when you're faced with those, that volume, those loads of work, those loads of priorities that are coming at you on your platters, wherever they are, you know, instead of reacting to the volume and, and getting really anxious about it, stop for a minute, breathe and get clarity on that list. What is it that I'm looking at and determine if it's really all yours to do first? Yeah, I think that's great. So the clarity piece of it for me is is huge. And so if you are if you're watching today um, and if this is your first time, uh, 
it really is about keeping it simple. And so one of the reasons why I love LinkedIn, it can be used for a lot of different things. Uh, but today I really want to use it uh, as a bit of a catalyst for action for some of you. You showed up for this session because the topic seemed relatable or maybe it's an area of dire need for you. Um, and so not only do I want you to take some action, it'd be great if you uh, will kind of lean into some accountability here. So you've invested the time and energy today to be here um, and, and specific to this topic of productivity. But that investment's going to be totally wasted if you don't actually do something with it. So uh, regardless of what you took out of the session, maybe there was a gold nugget there or maybe it's the, the action step that Laura just gave you. I want you to identify just one thing, one simple thing that you'll commit to doing over the next seven days to start taking your leadership to the next level, to create some of those leadership success habits. Again, whether you're a leader of a team or a leader of yourself. And once you have it, I want you to drop it in the comments. And so that when we get a chance to be together again next week, um, you can share how things went, um, successes you had, challenges you're running up against um, so that we can work on that together. So take 15 seconds now, uh, drop that into the comments, and we'd love to see uh, what you're focused in on. And while you do that, uh, I want to thank you again, Laura. It's so fun to have you with me. Um, it reminds me of all the conversations that we've had over the years, and I'm excited to put some of the tips that you've shared into practice. So thank you again. Oh, thanks for having me. It's super fun. And you're absolutely right. It was, it was very reminiscent of our long conversations and our action planning together. Thanks, uh, Will. So if you want to get a hold of Laura um, and hear more about her work, I'd encourage you to reach out to her here on LinkedIn. Uh, follow her post. She does a great job of, of interacting uh, with folks here. And so it'd be a great, even if, uh, if you're not interested right now in working with her, just to follow some of the things that she's doing. Uh, but don't miss it. So that brings us to next week. Um, I'm excited to announce that Evan Smith, uh, owner and consultant at Mo Metamorphosis Management Group, uh, will be joining me to explore how to ask real questions. And uh, you guys know my, my love for, for questions and the power that they have. So keep your eyes out for that LinkedIn event in your feed. Or if you'd like, drop a note in the chat and I'll personally invite you to that session um, so that you don't miss it. But again, I want to encourage you to take something that you heard today, put it into practice as soon as today so that you can be the leader that your team needs. And if you found this useful, please you know, drop a note on your own calendar to join us again next week. If you know of somebody that might uh, get some use or benefit out of that topic, uh, please invite them to come along with you. And if you've stumbled upon this video and we're not connected on LinkedIn, uh, reach out, mention the program, and we'll remedy that. But regardless, I want to thank you for being with us today, and I hope to see you again next week. Blessings.